Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, How to Land the Job, Interviewing Skills for Success, brought to you by your Vanderbilt Alumni Association. I'm Sarah Whitney Anderson, Assistant Director of Alumni and Student Engagement, and I'm so glad you could join us from wherever you are this afternoon. Today's webinar will last around 45 minutes with time at the end for questions. Please feel free to type questions as you have them into the questions box on the side panel of your screen throughout the presentation and we will make sure that these are addressed in some way before time is up. We will record today's webinar and post on, X, on the Expert Advice webpage on VU Connect, and we will also share the recording with you via email. Many of you know our presenter today from previous alumni career offerings here at Vanderbilt, and I am excited to be back with us for this presentation. Jeremy Payne is a Vanderbilt triple door with a passion for travel and making work successful anywhere. He currently serves as lecturer at Vanderbilt University in Human and Organizational Development at Peabody College. Prior to joining Peabody full-time, Jeremy was head of People Operations at Remote Year, a travel company that helps individuals keep their remote jobs while traveling the world. Jeremy has also worked with Young Presidents Organization in their forum department, served as Director of Leadership Performance for Brooksdale Senior Living and supported the global investment banking team as a performance consultant with Bank of America. He also holds certifications in various assessments and serves as an advisor startup striving to make a difference in the world. Along with his wife and daughter, Jeremy calls Nashville, Tennessee home. Together they enjoy the world-class music, the foodie scene, and the entrepreneurial spirit of their East Nashville neighborhood. Excited to turn it over to Jeremy. Thank you so much for that introduction, Sarah. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for attending today. Uh, in the wise words of uh, Southwest Airlines, we know you have many choices for your webinar, but we uh, want to thank you for webinaring with us. So you heard a little bit about me in the introduction from Sarah, but I find it helpful to share with audiences uh, just a bit more, uh, my face, for example, uh, so we can jump in and you can have a little more context to how I approach content and what I'll be sharing today. So with that, uh, here are a few pictures. Uh, I'm originally from Illinois, but Nashville, and in particular Vanderbilt, has played this huge role in my personal life and in my professional development. I had my first full-time job at Vanderbilt. I worked in the ID card office over the summers to help cover tuition. Uh, I held several graduate assistantships while I was doing my graduate work here, and I've served as an adjunct faculty member for just over 12 years before transitioning to a full-time faculty member here uh, uh, last fall. Uh, the bottom left there, you'll see a picture of myself and my wife, Alexandra. I met her here at Vandy. We were both in graduate school. Uh, that picture in the bottom left, by the way, is us on Cadillac Mountain in Arcadia National Park uh, in BC 2016. BC, of course, meaning before child. Uh, we were looking for inspiration in our life and our careers. And like any two level-headed individuals would do uh, with no kids at the time, we sold everything we owned, including our house, bought an RV, and traveled all over the US for a year working remote jobs where we can to uh, make sure we've got the cash and the resources to continue that journey. Uh, top right there, you'll see uh, the newest addition to our family. Uh, that's our daughter, Marnie. She was born here in Nashville at Vanderbilt University Hospital. Uh, she's the first true Tennessean in our family. My wife grew up overseas and I'm from Illinois. Uh, and I guess uh, the easiest way to describe Marnie is through some lyrics from a Drew Holcomb song. Uh, she's got her mama's sunshine and her daddy's rain. Uh, she's a piece of heaven in a hurricane. Uh, and then last but not least is our four-legged friends. My wife and I are into uh, animal adoption and that is our uh, most recent companion there, Ramble. He is wearing one of Alexandra's winter hats for scale. Uh, so I hope uh, this helps you get a little glimpse into my life and what Vanderbilt uh, has given me and means to me, uh, and also this fine city in Nashville. Uh, one more thing before we jump in, though. Uh, webinars are an excellent opportunity for professional development, but those of us that do them, and we full well know this, we tend to throw a lot of information at you and hope something sticks. Seth Gooden, uh, you see his picture up here on the slide now, proposes a different take on how to digest business content or professional development content. He says simply, decide before you start that you're gonna change three things about what you do all day at work or in life. And then as you're reading or consuming, find those three things and do it. And this is the big point here. The goal of reading or listening to a webinar then isn't to persuade you to change. 
it is to help you choose what to change. And so I wanna extend that same invitation to you. As we go through the content today, I've put more in than can be absorbed real time because uh, we'll provide you the slide deck as reference and of course the recording as reference. But uh, real time, what I'd love for you to do is find those three things. Uh, so let's dig in and see what resonates with you. Objectives for today are as follows. I wanna Describe different interview types to you so you have a general idea of what's out there. Many of you have probably already gone through several of these. Uh, then I want to identify the type that we find as career consultants um, that have the best results for you. I want to discuss how to then ask for this type of interview, explore some strategies for preparing for that, and then last but not least, create a follow-up plan once the interviews are done. Let's talk about some interview types. The one that most people are familiar with is something called a structural interview or a structured interview. These are typically very formal. They're very organized. They can be very, very complex behind the scenes. Uh, let me give you an example from my life. When I was running leadership performance at Brookdale, we used uh, a company called DDI and their product targeted selection um, to make a very complex process, uh, very, very simplified. We ended up creating panels of interviewers. Each were given pre-scripted questions, each focused on very different competencies. After we all interviewed independently, we'd come together, uh, create a holistic picture of that candidate, and then give that candidate a score. So that's one extreme of how structured these structured interviews can get. The one that most companies use, though, is what we call unstructured interviews. And just like the name implies, these are usually a very variety of open-ended questions, usually at the manager or the interviewer's discretion. Uh, the uh, interviewer themselves creates the content that is uh, important to them and hopefully aligns well with the job at hand. The next one uh, uh, our students tend to really love, these are the stress interviews. They're very similar to structured or unstructured interviews, but they have additional components to them. Usually that's something like time pressure or the demeanor of the interviewer. Uh, when I was interviewing for a sales job one time, and often stress interviews are used in sales, uh, the person interviewing me was real time correcting my behavior. I was holding a water bottle in one hand and I answered a question and I barely moved it to my right. And the interviewer looked at me and said, stop, don't ever do that again. And then asked me another question to continue. And you're darn sure I did not move that water bottle one more time. And yes, I did get that job, thank you. Uh, the next one I want to point out are what we call behavioral interviews. Behavioral interviews uh, talk about past performance. Usually companies that use behavioral interviews believe past performance is the best indicator of future behavior. They use a method some of you might be familiar with called STAR. That stands for Situation, Task, Action, and Result. So if I were to interview you and I asked you a question, I'm going to be looking for you to tell me the situation that was at hand the task you were working on, the action you took, and then the result those actions had. Just to put a little bug in the back of your head, that STAR method, if you can proactively provide that situation, task, action, and result, that will put you head and above most other candidates at a given time and will actually relieve the interviewer of uh, a lot of the task pressure they have in that moment and open up those conversations to be more general. Another method that's fairly common these days is a problem and case interview method. Usually you're presented with a problem to solve here. The solution, however, is the secondary component to these interviews. Oftentimes we do not care if you get it right or wrong. We're more interested in how you think. And so if you are presented with a problem or a case interview, make sure you're very clear. Make sure you share your entire thought process and not focused on the right answer, but how you would arrive at an answer and that will really also help separate you. And then last but not least, so this bucket of interviews called informational interviews. These are very informal conversations that you would have with someone that might be working in an area of interest to you. Uh, it's great for research. It is not a job interview. I do include it on here and I'll explain that momentarily. The objective of an informational interview is just that, it's research, it's data gathering, it's not to find a job. So we're gonna focus on just one of these types of interviews because one of these types of interviews is much more in your control and has shown to have much higher results than you actually landing the job. But before we do that, I have a story. So a policeman is walking by a bar one night and he sees an intoxicated man crawling around on the ground beneath a lamppost. 
something very similar to the picture that's in front of you there. And the policeman asks, hey, what are you looking for? And the intoxicated man goes, I'm looking for my house keys. I lost them around here. The policeman says, great, I'd be happy to help. And so together they start looking around under this street light. And after a few minutes, neither one of them can find these lost keys. So the policeman says, hey, are you sure this is where you lost your keys? And the uh, man goes, well, I'm not sure at all. I might have lost them over there in the alley. The policeman goes, then why aren't you looking in the alley? And the drunk man goes, because this is where the light is. And so anecdotal for sure, but it also shows something from our literature called observational bias. Uh, it's more commonly called the street light effect. When we are presented with data, we tend to migrate or look for answers to our problems in those things that are readily evident, well lit for us. And that's exactly what's wrong with most candidates' current mindset to job searching. Most job searchers, unfortunately, are using visible, obvious, low barrier to entry approaches. They're looking where the light is, and they typically, the light is on something like an internet job board. The actual jobs, however, are, you probably guessed this, hidden in that alleyway. They are hidden in the dark. And here's how we know this case. This gentleman who you're looking at now is Matt Youngquist. Matt is the founder and president of Career Horizons. He helps people uh, across the Pacific Northwest tackle uh, challenges like employment transition. Uh, he has an excellent quote I wanted to share with you. And that quote is, at least 70%, if not 80% of jobs aren't even published. And yet most people, job searching, are spending 70 to 80% of their time surfing the internet, looking at job boards, talking to employers, taking some chances, and realizing that the vast majority of hiring is friends and acquaintances, hiring other trusted friends and acquaintances. So Matt, much like many of uh, the career consultants I know, uh, help candidates realize that the jobs aren't really in the light. Let me uh, share with you some more data here. So in addition to the jobs being hidden, uh, the life of the recruiter also makes this very challenging. I had a successful colleague of mine from a mid-size organization, and mid-size here is between one and a thousand, a very wide span, but that's usually what we call mid-size. She was recruiting uh, a role that was in a crisis, and she was trying to figure out what to do. So she said, hey, listen, Jeremy, I have one active job posting right now, which that's a recruiter's dream. Uh, but I'm up here recruiting for it since the rest of my team is caught up in other projects. So she's one recruiter recruiting one job. However, it's a very popular job. She got over 10,000 applications in two weeks. And remember, this is a mid-sized company, so they don't have elaborate automated uh, um, algorithms or systems that are helping filter these candidates. And she says, listen, I, I just can't keep up. This is literally like finding a needle in a haystack. And she's not wrong. Uh, in addition to the jobs being hidden, the jobs that are available go through a recruiting process much like this, and sometimes not even uh, through a recruiting group. Sometimes it's just another duty on a hiring manager's plate, and that involves so many factors. You know, she is not alone. Even if you're qualified, you're not likely to be found. Timing, bandwidth of the recruiter, the recruiter waking up on the wrong side of the bed, none of these are in your control, and unfortunately, they're actually working against you. Now, I'm painting a pretty glum picture here, and we're gonna keep painting that picture. What you're looking at here are the results of a LinkedIn study from 2015. On the x-axis, you'll see job hunting status. So let me explain what that means. On the left-hand side, under or unemployed, that's the traditionally unemployed person actively looking for a job. The next group is an employed active, that's someone who is employed actively looking, like reaching out, applying to jobs. The next bit, is uh, the employed tiptoeing. These are people who currently hold jobs and are just kind of dipping a toe out there. They might uh, be a little more transparent, but they're not fully transparent. And then the last bucket is that employed passive. These are individuals who have no interest in another job. They might actually really enjoy the job that they have, uh, but other people are finding them. On the y-axis, you can see the percentages of each category, either applying, networking, internal, or other, that these individuals used to find their job. So if we look at this collectively, a couple of things stand out. One, networking is winning out across all of these spectrums. Granted, on the left-hand side, it's a bit 
um, less prominent. But if you are someone who is employed or is working on a contract or doing some side consulting, uh, networking is the clear indicator here of how you're going to find your next job. So then, what do you do? All of this paints a really interesting picture. And the answer that we have found and that we encourage everyone to do is to focus on that last category of interviews, the informational interview. Let me jump in there a little bit more so we're all on the same page about what international interviews are. There's a great book out there. It's been around for many, many years, many, many versions called What Color Is Your Parachute? And Richard Bowles, who's the author of this book, created this concept of an informational interview many, many years ago. He says that you should consider this information gathering phase just the research part of your overall job search. It comes first. For those of you Stephen Covey fans out there, Stephen Covey had a great phrase called, you know, seek first to understand. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. We want you to find the information first about what fields might be interesting, careers might be interesting. And I know that might sound less than efficient for some of you if you're actively looking. But what we find is that anecdotally, while one out of every 200 resumes that you put out there results in a job offer, one out of every 12 informational interviews results in a job offer. Conducting something that isn't even a job application results in a significantly higher likelihood that you'll be offered a job. So why is that? Let's check that out. Informational interviews have three main components. They're used to determine fit. So you wanna look at things like your personality, and your interest and your skills and all of those things and how you fit with certain industries or organizations. They're used for you to gain knowledge. Uh, a lot of the time, this knowledge uh, is held in what we call the mentors or the masters uh, or the prophets of the industries. And so to get out there and kind of untap that knowledge is a big, big deal. And then last but not least, the other thing informational interviews allow you to do that traditional job uh, don't allow you, job interviews don't allow you to do is actually improve your skills real time and help you define your own goals so you can become more clear on what constitutes uh, a career path for you. So let's take a look at a job interview traditionally. Let's put informational interviews on the side and let's just focus on what a traditional job interview looks like. Then we're going to take a look at what an informational interview looks like and highlight some of the advantages there. So the goal of a job interview obviously is to get a job offer. They're very transactional in nature though. Uh, remember uh, some of the interviews you may have been on. There's a set of questions asked of you. You answer those questions. There may be a handshake. There might be a follow-up, but most of the time, the majority of the time, that's the end of that transaction. They're very high stakes. And they're very formal. Uh, one of my favorite days in life was the day I no longer had to wear a necktie or a coat jacket. Uh, it was uh, never uh, uh, made me comfortable to be in that kind of attire. I know many people love that kind of attire and that's great on them. But when I had to put on a different persona to go into an interview, I was never putting my best step forward. The job interview is for a job seeker. That's fairly obvious. And then also the average length of these interviews is variable. I myself have been in interviews as brief as five minutes. Um, that did not go so well. And as long as uh, full days uh, uh, that, um, again, were various types of techniques used that we shared earlier. Job interviews are also usually led by the hiring manager. And they are usually restricted to just between two people. And then on your end, it requires research and preparation. And last but not least, a job interview always merits a thank you. So that's the traditional job interview. So let's switch gears and look at similar factors for an informational interview. Number one, the goal is for information finding. It's not to get a job. It's a very reciprocal interaction. It's not transactional. You're building a connection that you can then utilize later, as well as that individual can utilize later. They're very low stakes. And usually, you get to pick the setting. You get to show up how you want to present yourself. You don't have that added stress of having to put on the face and go into that office and sit across from someone in a hard table. They're for anyone. 
you don't have to be a specific age. You don't have to be going for a specific role. You don't have to have a specific credential. They are quite literally for anyone to engage in. On average, these only last 15 minutes. Sometimes they last a lot longer, but on average, they're very brief. Because again, remember the purpose is just for you to get information and make a connection. They're led by you instead of by the interviewer. You're the one that comes with the agenda. They're between two people. They also require research and preparation. And they also merit a thank you. So if we take a moment and look at traditional job versus informational interviews, it looks something like this. These are all the factors we just went over. But there in the middle, you see where they overlap. I do want to highlight just four differences that make a huge difference in the outcome of your job. So even though they do have similarities, here's what drives success if you go with informational interviews. That reciprocity concept is huge. Interesting, this is an element of persuasion, believe it or not. Showing an interest in someone, it's a genuine interest that isn't attached to a motive, creates a feeling in that person of reciprocity. They want to give you something back. And guess what? Often that results in either furthering a connection or an actual job offer. The second one I want to point out is that since they're lower stakes and less formal, this allows you to be more genuine. This reduces your anxiety, reduces your stress, and it allows the person you're speaking with, the receiver, a better chance of really seeing what you can bring to the table. It allows you to present with your best foot forward. Number three, they average only 15 minutes. This is really efficient, extremely efficient, and you you're likely setting the time and it's likely in a location that is comfortable for you. Especially when you factor in, you can do this virtually now, you can get on a Zoom call or a webinar call or a go-to meeting like we are now, and you can have this 15 minute interaction and be very genuine there. And then last but not least, remember informational interviews are led by you. This is by far the biggest one. You're driving the agenda and in order to do that well, you practice and you become really effective at creating efficient agendas. So that's what they are, uh, and that's comparing informational interviews to job interviews and highlighting some of the benefits. Now we're gonna switch gears and go into how to conduct those informational interviews. So there are four keys to success here in informational interviewing. The first step is research. Just like with any job search process, research is key to success here. Once your research is complete, we have an ask. You're going to go ask someone to uh, connect with you and interview. After that ask is done, you're going to prepare and conduct that interview, and then you'll finish by following up. So I want to dive a little bit into each of those areas with some more detail and some examples for you that hopefully you'll find helpful. So starting with research. Research can come in many, many flavors. For informational interviews, I'm going to recommend three different categories of research you should conduct. They are as follows. The first is that you should focus on um, industries that interest you. So I know many of you probably already know what industries interest you, but I recommend that you take a moment and really think through that. There's some really interesting recruiting information out there, and depending on your location, this varies. Even within just the US, for example, if you grew up on a coast, you're more likely to have at least 15 jobs and two to three different careers by the time you're 35. If you grew up in the Midwest like myself, that number is much smaller. If you grew up in the Southeast, it's even smaller. However, the idea behind that is you think you might know the industry that you're focused in on, but don't stop there. Go broad again and find those industries that are really interesting to you. Even if you don't know anything about them or don't think you're qualified, but you are interested in them, that's what's gonna drive informational interviews. The second bucket, Gather information on the organizational level. So once you've identified the industries, look at the kind of organizations you like in those industries. Most individual job seekers don't realize that within any industry, there are elements of for-profit work, there are elements of non-profit work, there are everything in between, social entrepreneurship, for example, or socially responsible companies. And all these industries have all of these category types. So the second phase would be finding specific organizations that interest you. When I was uh, graduating from graduate school, I uh, 
have a background in, improv in improvisational theater as well. And I was trying to figure out a way to bring all of this together. And at the time, 20 years ago, there was this new thing called human centric design, which is now on everyone's plate. This idea of starting with people and designing products and services around their needs and around their feedback uh, was still fairly new. And a lot of the techniques were uh, perceived somewhat radically. And so I didn't get a whole lot of buy-in around having a career early on in that world, but I did meet some amazing, amazing people because I knew the organizations in which they worked. Uh, I was employed at Lowe's companies, the home improvement competitor to Home Depot. I was uh, a designer and facilitator of management development at their corporate headquarters. And I went to do an orientation one day and the group that was next door to me was this group, a uh, company called Play out of Richmond, Virginia, who was a creative consultancy. They were doing this early human centered design work. And I uh, feel equal parts great and terrible about the fact that I went to my boss and said, can you cover this orientation? This company that I have researched for years and years is actually facilitating next door. And much to my boss's credit, they let me do that. Uh, and I got to sit in uh, and learn and gather information on a different organization than the one that was literally employing me that day. Uh, and I did not leave uh, Lowe's to go work at that organization, but I certainly still have contacts that I met that very day that work at play and now work in many other fields in this creative uh, consulting world. And then last but not least, the third bucket that I want you to focus on is people. So once you've identified the industry and the organization, find the people that make you excited. Find the people that instill within you a sense of wonder. Find the people who have backgrounds or who have accomplished things that you would love to accomplish one day. And those are the people that we really wanna focus on. So those are the three buckets of research. Now, conveniently, uh, I'm gonna give you a secret from a recruiting standpoint. We look at three areas of fit when you apply to an organization. And believe it or not, those three areas that we look like are very similar to the buckets I just went over with you. When we interview you, we're gonna first see if you fit with our organization. If you're not a fit there, then we won't even move you forward. Then we're gonna look to see if you're uh, uh, gonna be a good fit with the team that we're hiring for. It's not unlike the second level that we were talking about in our research here. And then last but not least, we're gonna see if you finally fit for that role. Most job thinker, seekers think that we start with job and role fit, and the reality is we don't. Uh, the org fit is often the easiest to decide because of values and culture and mission. Uh, and so it's much more efficient as recruiters for us to focus there. But if you're researching these things in preparation for informational interviews, again, you're already doing the work and can be ahead of us recruiters when you have your interviews. If you need another resource to help you research, uh, the Vanderbilt Career Center has some awesome stuff online and it's freely available to you. I'll make sure you have the link in the deck here. But what you're looking at now is the VU Center uh, researching worksheet for informational interviews. They use similar categories to what I just went over. They already have the questions there to help guide you in your own thinking. So an action item for you, uh, should this be one of those three things that you really take away from today, is to go to this presentation, grab that link, and uh, give that worksheet of you. So once you've done researching, our next step is to ask. It's to ask people for informational interviews. Let's discuss how to ask for that interview now. It looks like I just had a small error here. Let me just pull the presentation back up. And we're almost back on. So let's talk about how to ask. The thing I wanna really emphasize here about who to ask uh, has to do with your weak ties. Let me explain what I mean. So the idea here is you have strong and weak ties in your network. This happens in social networks, this happens in real life networks, but using and maintaining your socially weak ties and not just your strong ties has huge benefits when it comes to the job search. So there's a researcher called Matt Granovetter and he refers to your strong ties as your friends and your weak ties as your acquaintances. He has a paper called 
notes on the strings of weak ties, and I'll make sure this is linked in here for you as well if you want to read the research behind it. But Mark talks about the interpersonal relationships between different and disparate groups of people and how those relationships hold different sections of society together. Think about it this way. A strong tie is someone who you know well. You probably have their number on your cell phone. You might interact with them on social media. Uh, you have a good two-way conversation going. Uh, you know them pretty well, information flows freely. You don't have to introduce yourself each time you meet. A weak tie, though, is a more tenuous relationship. Um, once a year, you might send them a Christmas message and you might promise to get in touch with them. Uh, you might have to look up their number if you wanna reach out to them or you might have to uh, do a quick social network research before you reach out and use one of those prompts to just remind them of who you are. Uh, most people, when looking for a job, will start close. They will start with those strong network ties. However, a weak tie is more crucial when it comes to job searching. Just take a look at the two pictures in front of you. On the left, that strong tie, while those relationships are incredibly strong, it's a very restricted look at a network. You're only going to have access to the jobs that those individuals and the people those individuals are extremely well connected to. Compared to the right-hand side, imagine that center circle or your strong connections and all of those other circles are organizations or industries or groups of people. And notice how all of those weak ties are what's really expanding your network here. That's the best part, is that at the end of the day, by going through your strong ties and connecting with your weak ties, you can think uh, uh, that this automatically brings trust, this automatically brings an interest to you, even if those weak ties don't know you well. That social validation of having them go through the strong ties is it. So to summarize this, when you're looking for people to interview from an informational interview standpoint, you don't want to directly go with your strong contacts. You want to utilize your strong contacts to find those weak contacts to expand that network. So how would you get to them? A couple of options. Email is an easy one. Uh, email's quick, email's easy. Most people are checking it, uh, believe it or not, something like 47 times a day, if not more. Uh, and it is a, a known form of communication that most people have access to. LinkedIn is an excellent job site. If you haven't been on LinkedIn, it's a great job site, but even more so, it is basically a large collection of social ties, both strong and weak. So you can absolutely use that model on LinkedIn. And then last but not least, you can call. Uh, calling is uh, amazingly radical these days and it can really set you apart. And uh, whenever I have my students, for instance, uh, reach out, I recommend that they call because their return rate on actually getting informational interviews is much higher with a call. So taking those into account, I have a few more tips. First of all, people want to help other people. So if you're the kind of person who hesitates on reaching out because you might feel like you're bothering someone or it won't be worth their time, just know that for the most part, there's a piece of us as humans that makes us want to help other people. So take advantage of this. Also, as mentioned, it's easiest to connect with people through a shared colleague. So make sure when you reach out, you say something like, Jeremy suggested I give you a call. And then last but not least, if it's possible, even though phone is great and conferencing and video conferencing is great, if you can meet in person, do that. Coffee, tea, uh, something, you know, snack size as opposed to a full lunch or dinner, just something to give you both a place of informality so you each can really give each other the focus uh, and really present your true self in the way that's needed. For those of you that like to have a script or some guidance here, I have a couple examples. This is a, a full script that you could use. You could use it in email. Uh, the character count here actually fits in an in-mail on LinkedIn. And of course, you could also read this uh, should you use a phone call. But here are the components. You always wanna do a greeting, obviously. Hello, whoever you're speaking with. My name is blank and I'm currently a, a blank at blank. So for me, that would be, hello, my name is Jeremy and I'm currently a lecturer at Vanderbilt University. Uh, you could also use an alum at Vandy if you're speaking to a weak tied connected uh, alum. The second thing, get right into it. I'm interested in learning more about the finance industry or whatever industry you're interested in. If you know more than that, like my example here, make sure you include that. So specifically, I wanna know more about commercial real estate lending. So Dr. Payne suggested you might be able to help me. Do you have a few minutes to answer some questions or do you have about 10 minutes to answer? Uh, 
then go right into the close. I'm available on Tuesday. I'm available next Thursday. And I'd be happy to meet you for coffee or if you prefer via phone. And then last but not least, thank you in advance. I look forward to connecting. So a very simple script there that you can use and adapt for whatever modality you want. An action item for you after the call today, take a few minutes and think about people that you have in your larger network, strong and weak ties, uh, and use these three categories. Think of someone who would be easy to connect with, probably someone who one of your strong ties has mentioned time and time again. Think of someone who might be a dream interview, someone who just seems slightly out of reach, but we could figure out a way for you to get to them. And then last but not least, think about an unexpected interviewer, someone who might be in a completely different sector, but you just find them so fascinating that it would be worth your time and their time to spend time with them. So our third of four steps is to prepare and conduct that interview. Um, I'm going to go fairly quickly through here because the slides I've prepared for you here are more for your reference than they are for me to read or share with you out loud. But the core here is you want to make sure that you are preparing questions that are appropriate and relevant to the audience that you're meeting with. Keep in mind, in 10 or 15 minutes, that is not a lot of time for a lot of questions. You're going to be very lucky to get through three to five questions in that time. You can always meet again later. You can always follow up using electronic communications. Um, so you wanna be very judicious with your words and you wanna pick great, great questions that get you the information you're seeking in a very efficient way. So same categories we talked about before. Start with some industry questions. Maybe you pick one of these. And just to give you an example, uh, the first one, how do people find out open positions in this field? Uh, usually insider knowledge will lead you somewhere else, not a job board. A question like that that's open-ended as well will often help the receiver of your question, that person you're interviewing, uh, kind of open up and maybe share some of their connections with you. So the second level in this is that you want to ask some career exploration questions, maybe one or two career exploration questions. So tell me about this career. Is it high turnover? Um, what kind of skills or personalities are best suited for this world? So warm them up with an industry question. The industry questions, um, likely your interviewing candidate knows more about their industry than you could ever glean from them, and they'd be happy to share that. And then jump into a little bit more of a specified kind of career exploration question. And then last but not least, focus in on your specific subject. This is your chance to ask a key question that is very specific to the person you're interviewing. A couple reasons for this. The first, obviously, you're going to get that information and take it with you. But the second is it's gonna show that you took the time to learn about them. It's gonna add some more to your authenticity and then therefore, ideally, reflect back in some reciprocity for you later. The fourth stage is our closing and our thank you. Uh, I have a script for you here I wanted to share very briefly, again, for your reference. But closings and thank yous often get rushed through. And so what I wanna highlight here is uh, this is key. We have another effect in social science called the recency effect. And it happens day in, day out, hundreds if not thousands of times to all of us. So whatever we see or hear most recent is what we're likely gonna recall first. And when you're finishing an informational meeting, more often than not, that receiver is going to remember how you close that meeting. So here's what I recommend. The first step is just pause after you've asked your last question. Maybe look at your watch, update the person you're interviewing of the time, you know, share with them where everyone is at this point and make it very clear that, that you're respectful of their time and that, that you're ready to uh, move on. Then you're going to ask them. You're going to ask them a final question or create a reason to follow up. That final question can be another personalized question. It could be something just about them that maybe come up that you want to know more about. Uh, I often get asked about working remotely, even if I'm not uh, being interviewed for that. Uh, so you might ask another creative question at that point. Then you wanna make sure you say thanks again. Uh, stand up, go ahead and offer them a handshake if you're in person. Uh, if you're not in person, obviously, no need to stand up or handshake. Um, but let them know how you're gonna use their advice. Just one simple thing. You're gonna reflect on it. You're going to change something you do in the current job that you have tomorrow. Uh, you're going to reach out to someone else. All kinds of options here, but let them know you're going to use it then you're gonna request. 
you don't already have their contact information or you only have an email and maybe get their phone, this is a great time to ask for that. And then you're gonna finish up with after that meeting, to spend a few minutes in the car, write down two or three things in your notebook, on a note card, uh, on your phone, that allows you to recall the conversation you had because you're gonna wanna refer to that conversation later in our last step. And our last step is following up. Here's a template that you can use for your electronic communications as a thank you, uh, or you can read it very simply uh, if you're thanking via phone. Within 24 hours though, I recommend you do send an email or other form of electronic communication, maybe a LinkedIn message, uh, sharing these basic steps. So make sure that you remind them when you met, they are likely very busy people. Make sure you recap um, how much you appreciated uh, their time and their information. And then if someone referred to you, referred you to them, make sure that you mention that you'll follow back up with that referrer and uh, let them know how it went. But that's not the very end. There's a couple more steps you need to do down the road to final, finalize your informational interviewing process. The first is to continue the research into industries and organizations and people that excite you. Don't just do this transactionally. People that uh, are very, very good at finding new jobs, even if they're not interested in a new job, are networkers. They utilize this technique of informational interviewing, not for personal gain, but just to make those genuine connections and they do it at these levels. Make sure that you reach back out to the people you've met with at a cadence that makes sense to you. For some people, that could be weekly. For other people, that might just be quarterly or once a year, depending on your industry or what you're looking to accomplish. Just make sure you find a cadence that works for you and for that person whom you interview. And yes, it is true that some interviews will stop there. You might follow up and they don't want to follow up anymore and that's fine. That's another reason why we want you to do as many informational interviews as possible. On occasion, you might want to reach back out and just say, hey, here's a quick update of where I am. Is there anyone else that you recommend that I'd speak to in this industry or in this organization or that's in this role at a different company? And then last but not least, if you find an individual you would like to connect with, make sure you utilize these weak connections that are now growing stronger every day. Uh, think about LinkedIn here. Uh, this is a great way for you to ask someone for coffee, get them connected to you on LinkedIn, and then see who they're connected to, see if there's anyone else that you're interested in connecting to that way. And then of course that starts your informational interviewing process again. Just one more thing before we wrap up today. If you find that you're not getting the traction you need through informational interviewing, and if you find you are getting the traction you need, there is one other person that will make or break your job decision. And that person is the hiring manager. And I'm not talking about the hiring manager's ability to make the decision on you. I'm talking back to our conversation about fit. Loosely coupled connections are going to introduce you to some great people. As you get closer to getting that job offer, Make sure that you meet as many times as it takes for you to really understand how that manager works, how they manage their team members, and get a best guess or a best read of what your relationship with that manager is going to be like. The one piece of advice that I can leave you is you want to find a job that you love, that you, you want to show up for every day. It doesn't have to be the absolute perfect job. Those don't exist. But you want to find a job that makes you want to wake up in the morning, most mornings, and go and knock it out of the park. But the, the dirty secret in organizations is that it's not the organization that makes people leave. And it's not even the job that makes people leave. It's actually that manager that makes people leave. In fact, a Gallup poll of a million people concluded that the number one reason people quit their jobs is because they had a bad boss or an immediate supervisor. Like, this is 75% of people that leave jobs to it because of this. So use informational interviewing to gain that information and just trust the process to know that you'll get a higher job offer rate doing that. And as you get closer to closing that job offer, spend as much time as you can with that manager because they're gonna make or break your experience at that company. And with that, I'd be happy to open it up for any questions. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I know I took a lot of tips and tricks from this presentation, um, but as we said, we will start taking questions. So if anyone has any, feel free to put those in the question box on your panel, um, and we will get this answered. All right, the next, the, our first question is, sorry, I'm going to pull this up bigger. Can you say a bit about how to network? Yeah, absolutely. So there is an excellent resource out there if you're a book reader. It's called Never Eat Alone. Uh, it's an awesome book. It's got this nice bright orange cover. It's, it's very easy to find. Um, also available on Kindle, of course. Uh, and Never Eat Alone has a ton of examples of this, but at the core of it is it's, it's basically say, find something that's already part of your daily ritual, eating, lunch, as an example, and then connect that to an incentive to connect with someone else. So don't try to make it a new part of your day. If you're not a, an extroverted personality as a starting point, don't try to become someone you're not. Instead, find something you do, uh, like eating lunch, that allows you to invite someone uh, to do that with you. Uh, a couple other examples in addition to eating lunch. One, uh, working out. If you happen to be a gym rat uh, or spend a lot of time at the gym, uh, you'll make a lot of great connections that way. Come work out and go for a run with me. Um, coffee that we mentioned earlier is another great one. Uh, those are all great ways to start networking. Uh, to get really good at it, at the end of the day, most of the research and the advice just says that you develop a genuine interest in people, that you approach conversations and you approach individuals that you meet with just a genuine interest in who they are. Uh, one of the best examples of this that I was ever given was um, when I moved to Nashville 20 years ago, we had kind of this running joke that it was not uncommon to be introduced and you were asked three things very, very quickly. The first is, what do you do for work? The second is, where do you go to church? And the third was, where do you live? Uh, and it was really interesting if you were moved to Nashville from a, a region not like that. Uh, for many people, it was very off-putting, particularly if you weren't a churchgoer or you were unemployed. One of the best pieces of advice I got was to say, instead of those questions, ask somebody, what do they do that keeps them busy? Uh, what, what kind of hobbies do you have? What's something that you don't think is interesting but other people you've spoken with find fascinating about you? Ask those questions that are broader that demonstrate a real true interest to who they are, and uh, the network becomes naturally uh, easier over time. Wonderful. Our next question is, would you say this type of approach works also for higher level positions like director or VP or more for beginner, be, whoo, beginner level? Uh, it works for all levels. Let me give you a few examples on why I, I know that is the case. Uh, informational interviewing is something we do with our students here from a, a first job perspective. We actually start this process when they're writing papers. Uh, so they're just doing informational interviews to accomplish a task. And of course, people love to help students, so that we have a pretty high success rate. But more often than not, we'll have students get job offers or at least connections from those contacts that they wrote some paper for three to four years ago when they start to enter the workforce. So on one end of the spectrum, we've, we've got personal success data there, but most of my colleagues will, will reflect that same kind of thing. When I worked at YPO, that's Young Presidents Organization. This is a membership association of about 25,000 CEOs throughout the world. One of the uh, kind of badges of pride uh, that CEOs share where when they take new jobs, um, they don't have resumes. Uh, they, when I would ask to see an example of a resume or my job at YPO was to hire facilitators and I would make them give me a resume and often the facilitators were CEOs who wanted to do this on the side, they would respond with, well, I don't, I don't have a resume. Uh, and so I would always, you know, in, indulge them in conversation and it comes to find out they don't use resumes. When it's time to get a new job, they're either using networking or connecting or some kind of proxy for that matchmaker connecting and networking. But all of that still falls in that, that same idea of using information finding and building those relationships and therefore building the network over time.
All right, our next question. Can you talk more about how to prepare for the types of interviews you outline, such as structured, unstructured, behavioral um, interviews, or resources to study um, upon these? Absolutely, I can. In fact, I'll pull that slide back up um, if it's going to let me. Uh, so let's start with structured interviews. Uh, structured interviews are, believe it or not, one of the more easy uh, interview types to prepare for because you know the elements that compose that. You're going to enter a situation where people are going to ask you predetermined questions. And you also know, more often than not, they're looking for examples of your past behavior to address those open-ended questions. So as an interviewee, one of my pieces of advice is to think of the successes that you have had in your career or as a student, if you're early career, and write one paragraph about that success. Start with what the situation was. If it's a paper, start with, I had a final paper that where I had to analyze a small group uh, over the course of a semester and then go into the task. What did you specifically contribute to that scenario? So my specific role was to do the environmental scan of uh, the organizations that my small group decided to focus on and then the actions that you took. So to do that scan, I first learned how to build a project plan in Microsoft Excel, then I researched environmental scanning techniques and et cetera, et cetera. And then what happened was the result of that was we finished our paper, we turned it on a time, and we ended up receiving an A minus, which was uh, above the class average. Uh, so at the end of the day, regardless of the type of interview, uh, structured specifically though, you know they're gonna be open into behavioral questions, you know they're gonna be predetermined, and you know that you have elements of your life accomplishments already that you could write. The other nice thing about writing those in paragraphs is most of the open-ended questions are just that. They're slightly vague enough that if you have pre-scripted answers, you can apply those to various questions. You don't have to be perfectly um, fit with the question that's asked of you. Uh, let me give you an example. A, a popular behavioral question is, you know, tell me about a time when you uh, successfully completed a project. And so you might use the paper example I just gave you or you might use the example of uh, the time when you built a uh, e-learning, uh, five minute e-learning on a new system uh, and you received a 9.7 out of 10 satisfaction score. Uh, so you can prep for these interviews, you just have to be okay with having flexibility to apply your preparations to answers that might not 100% align but are in the general ballpark. So that's for structured interviews. Unstructured interviews are by far the hardest to prepare for because you don't know what's coming at you. So my recommendations for unstructured interviews, if you find yourself sitting across from someone who it's clearly they're just asking you questions off the whim, maybe not taking notes, um, maybe asking you uh, questions that might actually go more personal and not work related, uh, my advice is to take a beat before you answer anything. Feel free to be restrictive in what you're willing to share, particularly on the personal side. Uh, and then you can also, if you've done the prep, you can start to tell the stories that you've prepared uh, by simply handling questions like, I hear, from my understanding, here's what you're asking. I don't have an exact example of that, but I do have a, a close example. Let me tell you this story. So it's a, a way to redirect and take back control of the answer and bring structure to what would normally be an unstructured conversation. Wonderful. Um, our last question that we're going to take is what advice do you have for career switchers? Career switchers. First of all, don't be ashamed of career switching. A lot of us uh, sometimes internalize that and think that um, if we're moving out of a career, it's because it wasn't, it wasn't a, a good thing or that we failed at something. Uh, and that's just not the reality of the situation. Um, I'm a proud career switcher. I've had four or five different careers um, just in my 20 years of full-time work. Um, because at the end of the day, a lot of your competencies and your talents and your skills transfer across all, all careers and all industries. Um, so the first thing is you know, embrace it, don't be ashamed by it. Uh, the second thing is, and I kind of hinted at this in, in item number one there, is most of what you're bringing to the table is going to be relevant regardless of where you exercise those skills and talents. Um, so 
don't discount anything you did across industries or from a different career because it will be highly, highly relevant. And then the third piece here is turn all of that into the ultimate strength. Um, the creative world, uh, the, the, the world of creation, uh, human centered design, design thinking, creative consultancy, they all have an, uh, a process called cross pollination. And it's when you take ideas from different domains and you create something new. Higher education is a really good example of this. We're creating all of this research all the time and we have all of these problems flowing through the same organizational system. And we just attach random solutions to random problems and sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't, but we get to call it all research. It's that same concept. So I would recommend uh, not even trying to hide it, but embrace it. Talk about the benefits that you would bring to this new environment that the peers in the same role would not have. Uh, just based on your experience from a different career or a different industry. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for sharing all these great tips with us today. And thank you also to all of our attendees for participate, participating and sharing these wonderful questions. Um, I really think we had a great discussion this afternoon. I just want to encourage you again to check all of our career resources and events, both electronic and in person, provided to you by the Vanderbilt Alumni Association. Later um, this afternoon or Monday, I will be sending up a follow-up email with this archived link and the slides, um, as well as a request for feedback on our presentation this afternoon. We are always looking to improve upon our offerings to alumni, so please be in touch and let us know how we can best support you. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day.